Good morning, and everybody, and uh, good afternoon to those of you who are coming, calling from other uh, time zones, or good evening. Um, great to see a big uh, uh, list of attendees here and a growing list still as, as we're getting started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with a few uh, introductory remarks. Um, and as we uh, get going here. Um, so first, I guess, let me introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Jack Baker. I'm a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Stanford uh, and helping to uh, host the talk today. Uh, as we get started with this uh, webinar, a, a few logistical notes. Um, so this is a, a webinar format, as, as you've probably noticed. So just the speaker and myself will be uh, on camera here today uh, and, and able to uh, speak under the webinar. Uh, you should have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, um, and you can submit questions there at any time, so during the talk as well, um, and those will just uh, accumulate, and as host, I'll be able to see those, and I'll work to um, kind of relay questions to Alice at the end of the seminar so we can have a, a Q&A session. Um, so we're going to use that format rather than have uh, individual participants ask questions. Um, I anticipate we'll have a lot more questions than we have time for to discuss, so apologies in advance. If, uh, if we don't get to your question, but we'd love to hear your, your questions through that Q&A button. Um, so let me make a few introductory remarks and then we'll uh, get over to the, um, the meat of the, the presentation. So first I wanna say a few words about the, the Shaw Family Fund. Um, so the, the photo here in the upper left is the Shaw Family. This is uh, from left to right, Hemant, Haresh, Joan, and me here, um, who have a, a long and, and close ties to the university. Um, so Professor Haresh Shah uh, in the middle was a longtime professor and department chair in the Department of Civil and, Environment, Civil and Environmental Engineering um, and really played a huge role in, in shaping the research thrusts of the university and uh, of the department and the focus on catastrophe risk. Um, me here and Hemant are, are alums of the uh, university and, and Hemant is another pioneer in, in catastrophe risk modeling and longtime CEO of risk management solutions. Uh, their family generously created this family fund a number of years ago that sponsors a, a number of great activities, a staff award, uh, many student fellowships. I know many people on the call today have probably been supported or are being supported from those student fellowships. Um, and also this distinguished lectureship that allows us to bring in thought leaders from all over the world. And, and we've had a, a number of great conversations over the years through this uh, lectureship of which today is the latest installment. Um, uh, so uh, we have you know, great gratitude for the fa Shaw family for, for these activities that they're generosity is, has enabled. Uh, uh, Professor Shah, I guess uh, one more photo just to zoom in on that a little bit. Um, you know, he's, he's a pioneer as well in catastrophe risk modeling, a, a really truly energetic uh, a leader and it continues to be a, a thought leader and a source of energy uh, for me personally and I know for many people around the world uh, in academia and industry. And so um, you, you, think you can get a sense of his, uh, um, his energy from this photo that we love to, to pull up over the years. Then I wanna make a few comments about our speaker today. Um, so Alice Hill uh, is joining us. She's currently at the Council on uh, Foreign Relations. Um, previously, she was a special assistant to President Barack Obama. Uh, and in his uh, administration was a senior director for resilience policy at the National Security Council. Um, so she was working at the highest levels of government on policy around climate change and resilience. Uh, she has a truly impressive bio um, that you can, you can see in the flyer for this seminar. I'm not gonna read the entire thing. Uh, here, uh, but I'll share a few personal uh, notes to kind of supplement that. Uh, so I, I had a fortune to meet her a few years ago uh, when she was at the Hoover Institute at Stanford and, um, and then worked with her a little bit on a report she was preparing around uh, disaster resilience and, and climate change. And I was just struck by a, a few characteristics. So number one, her, her passion for this area. Um, she, you can just see the, the and, and I'm sure you'll see here in a few moments, the, the passion she brings to this work. Um, she had a very successful career as a federal prosecutor and a judge, and she left that track to move into the policy world on climate change due to her, uh, her belief of the, um, the critical need for work in this area. She also has a really tremendous ability to connect with engineers and scientists and policymakers, and she comes from the, you know, the, with a the policy lens to these um, problems, but the, you know, the understanding and respect she brings to, the people, to all the different disciplines rely, required to work in climate change policy um, was really uh, remarkable, and I think as a as an engineer contributing to some of her work, I, uh, I you know felt respected and heard, and and really learned a lot about the ways in which you know my own work could contribute to these bigger questions. Um, then uh, another uh, connection that I had with her was was through this book. Oh, I guess my Zoom is cutting me out. I know a number of people on the call have this book, uh, Building a Resilient Tomorrow. Let's see if Zoom will let me uh, get it up here. Um, 
that Alice was the, the one of the two co-authors on. And I think that was really a revelation in that, uh, you know, talking about the big problems we have uh, and we're facing now and, and in the coming uh, years with climate change, but also focused very much on solutions and, and what kind of actions can we take to be making progress and, and what kind of decisions and hard decisions are we going to have to make in the coming years and, and where are the research needs. And I think this, this focus on kind of identification of problems, translation to solutions, and, and then kind of looking at the policy recipes um, that we're going to have to think about to, to solve these problems. The, the weaving together of that I found really um, unique, uh, you know, combined with her passion and, and communication ability. Um, I thought that was just a, a really striking for me personally, you know, and, and so I think looking at the, you know, the challenges our world faces now, um, the activities going on at Stanford around um, initiatives related to climate change and sustainability, um, it, it just seemed like she was a, an excellent fit for this Shah lectureship to uh, come speak to us about her ideas on uh, climate change and, and solutions. And uh, great, so uh, with, uh, uh, yeah, so with that as background, um, a, a little bit on, on Alice, uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to her. Alice, are you okay over there to take the floor? Yes, uh, I've have been having a few internet connections, so problems, but I'm delighted it's working right at the moment, and I want to just say thank you so much. I am so honored to be with you here today. I want to thank you particularly, uh, Jack, as well as the Bloom Earthquake Engineers Engineering Center for inviting me. I also want to thank the Shaw family for their generosity and foresight in creating this lecture on catastrophic risk. The Shaw family's commitment to reducing catastrophic risk is inspiring. It's also prescient, for as we are seeing increasingly across the globe, in an interconnected world, ca catastrophic risk can bring communities, cities, and even nations to their knees. Unfortunately, we don't have to go far to find examples of cascading failures stemming from the emergence of just a single catastrophic risk. Just look at last month's experience in Texas. The state plunged into darkness and freezing cold, the event caused billions of dollars of personal property and infrastructure damage. The loss of power, waste, water treatment, transportation, and healthcare services imposed untold misery on the residents of Texas, all in the midst of a pandemic. The extreme cold that Texas experienced was not unprecedented, as some media reports led us to believe. In 1983, Texas suffered a cold outbreak that was just as cold and long lived as that of last month. The harm that Texas experienced stemmed in large part from its decisions not to invest money in preparing its electric grid for cold temperatures. That ch choice in hindsight appears stunningly short-sighted with the estimates of damage ranging as high as $90 billion. If Texas had taken a different course, choosing instead to invest in risk reduction before disaster strikes, it would have saved not only money, but also lives. We know that every dollar spent on risk reduction can save six or more dollars in disaster recovery. This means that all of us should take steps today to reduce the harm that tomorrow will bring. Dr. Shaw, the Shaw family, as Jack has shared, have played leading roles in finding ways to reduce risk, particularly seismic risk. Today, I will talk about what we can learn from another catastrophic risk, pandemics, to inform preparation for an emerging catastrophic risk from climate change. All three of these risks, earthquakes, pandemics, and climate change impacts, have the capacity to cause widespread harm. Both earthquakes and pandemics, of course, have already been experienced widely throughout the entire arc of human history. For example, an earthquake in China in 1556 is believed to be the deadliest in history. It's estimated that that single event caused 830,000 people to lose their lives. In the 14th century, the Black Death killed a third of the world's population. And in 1918, 50 million people lost their lives in the Spanish flu pandemic. 
As a result of hundreds of years of experience with these two risks, earthquakes and pandemics, we knew a lot more about what needs to get done to adequately prepare. Climate change impacts, on the other hand, bigger storms, greater temperature extremes, larger wildfires, more extreme precipitation, what emergency managers call rain bombs, as well as melting permafrost and sea level rise, all of these threats are unfamiliar to humans in the scale and scope that they will be occurring with climate change. Humans simply have little or no experience with the ferocity of the events that climate change spawns. And that unfamiliarity leaves us deeply unprepared. Mauna Loa Observatory sits 11,145 feet above sea level in Hawaii. Since 1958, scientists at the laboratory have gathered to track the accumulation of carbon emissions in the atmosphere. In 1958, the amount of CO2 had reached 315 parts per million. That's up from an estimated concentration of 280 parts per million during the pre-industrial era. As carbon emissions accumulate, they form a kind of blanket around the globe that retains heat. Somewhat like when you snuggle under a blanket on a cold winter's night. Over time, the heat under the blanket begins to increase because of your body heat. It wasn't until a sweltering day in June 19. 88, however, that the warnings about the heating phenomena from the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere entered central stage. In June of 1988, scientist Jim Hansen told Congress that he was 99% sure that record temperature increases resulted from the growing concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere rather, rather than the natural variation of climate. By then, 1988, atmospheric levels of carbon at Mauna Loa had climbed to 353 parts per million. By 1988, I was already embarked on a career as a federal prosecutor focused on white collar crime. What I knew about climate change, like so many Americans, came from whatever media I decided to read and listen to. But shortly after the election of Barack Obama as US president in November 2008, my phone rang. On the other end was Janet Napolitano, a friend from law school, and she was asking, how'd you like to come to Washington? That moment yielded one of the most important pieces of career advice I can share. Be nice to those you sit next to in school. President Obama had recruited Janet Napolitano to become Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. DHS is the third largest agency in the federal government after the Department of Defense and Veteran Affairs. She asked me to join as her senior counselor while she served as secretary. DHS, you'll recall, had been born out of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. It resulted from the largest reorganization of government since the creation of the Department of Defense after World War II. In addition to its deep anti-terrorism focus, DHS shoulders broad security responsibilities across its close to two dozen agencies. Those agencies include FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and the US Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard is responsible for protection of American waterways. Not long after I arrived at DHS, President Obama issued one of his first executive orders on climate change. That was in October 2009. It required all federal agencies to find ways to cut their carbon emissions, but also for the first time to plan for the impacts of climate change. By October 2009, when I received that assignment, Mauna Loa scientists had detected carbon concentrations of 384 parts per million. To respond to Obama's order, I assembled a task force. 
the members of the task force asked a basic question, one that in retrospect seems somewhat insubordinate to the president's direction. But until that question had a solid answer, I knew it would be difficult to garner enthusiasm for the task of preparing for climate change. In the face of widespread skepticism about the reality of climate change, we asked ourselves, should the Department of Homeland Security, with all of its other responsibilities, care about the impacts of climate change? We heard from dozens of scientists, planners, and security experts, including the US Navy Task Force Climate Change, NASA, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. In due time, we learned about the projected hurricanes, wildfires, droughts that could pummel America and the rest of the globe in the near future. Based on the evidence, the task force had its answer. DHS should care deeply about climate change. It would affect virtually all of the department's missions. In addition to working on climate change, Secretary Napolitano also asked me to head the DHS leadership group on biological threats. DHS had responsibility for coordinating federal efforts with those of state, local, and tribal governments in preparing for and responding to biological threats, ranging from an influenza pandemic to an aerosolized anthrax attack. It was because of this work and my time on the National Security Council staff as special assistant to the president and senior director for resilience policy that I realized that climate change and pandemics bore deep similarities. Both risks are when, not if problems. Both carry deep uncertainty as to their precise timing and scope, but not as to whether they will occur. Success in combating these two risks requires public support and pub political leadership. Fighting pandemics and climate change requires use of science to inform decision making. Both of these risks are borderless disasters. By that I mean that they will not honor the jurisdictional boundaries humans have crafted over the centuries. And because they cross borders freely, efforts to address the threats must cross borders as well. Communities and nations should work together to reduce the risks. With both pandemics and climate change, it's the most vulnerable among us, people with disabilities, women and girls, older people and the marginalized that pay the highest price. Any programs to counter these threats must account for the disproportionate impacts. Once the threats materialize, they undermine critical systems, including finance, public health, transportation, and national and human security. They act as threat multipliers, increasing vulnerability to horrors like economic impoverishment and criminal mayhem. As the pandemic revealed, failed, weak, or sluggish response in the immediate aftermath of disaster provides inroads for bad actors to use humanitarian aid to recruit members and expand territory. Houthi rebels in Yemen told young prospects that it's better to die a martyr in heroic battles than dying at home from the coronavirus. El Chapo's daughters delivered hand sanitizer and other pandemic supplies in box stamped with the head of the Sinaloa cartel's picture. And perhaps most important of all, greater preparation and early action can buffer the damage from these risks. For both climate change and pandemics, an ounce of prevention will yield at least a pound of cure. But climate change diverges from the pandemic in one very significant aspect. Climate change brings ever worsening extremes. Global lockdowns to contain the spread of COVID-19 put the brakes on economic activity worldwide. The economic slowdown in turn led to a precipitous 8% decline in worldwide emissions in the first six months of 2020. That downturn in emissions exceeded any decreases experienced since, the World, War II, uh, since World War II. But the accumulation of greenhouse gas emissions was merely slowed, not stopped. Even with many of us staying home around the world, emissions continue to climb. 
by December 2020, they were up 2% over 2019. In 2020, CO2 emissions ratcheted up to 418 parts per million, the highest level in human history and likely the highest since 3 million years ago when sea levels were 60 feet above those today. And with those emissions comes greater heat and greater impacts. But with climate change, there is no vaccine. So how can we have a better future? The planet has enjoyed a re relatively steady climate for close to 10,000 years, with global temperatures and sea level rise remaining stable. Under these conditions, human civilization has flourished. The assumption that the Earth's climate will continue to remain steady has traditionally safely guided pretty much every decision that humans make about how and where to live. But that assumption is no longer sound. 2020 showed us that. So many named storms occurred in the Atlantic that we had to turn to the Greek alphabet just to name them. Zombie fires burned in the Arctic where thermometers hit over 100 degrees and the highest ever recorded temperature on Earth, probably 130 degrees Fahrenheit, was registered in the aptly named Death Valley in California. Because all of our systems were built to withstand the extremes of the past, our infrastructure is at ever growing risk. We have decided, for example, how close we can build to the river or the coast based on past levels of flooding. We've determined how much power our electric grids must be able to generate in conditions of past historical heat and typically past cold. But what just happened in Texas with cold weather shows us that if our electric grid collapses under extremes, it pulls down almost every other system right along with it. This means that going forward, decisions about where and how we build must account for future risk. With climate change, it's what lies ahead that counts. One of the most basic steps to having a better outcome is to take early action. And to take early action, it's useful to plan. Planning is a universally recognized way to improve disaster response. Planning can drive creation of stockpiles of necessary supplies, investments in innovation and scientific research. President Dwight Eisenhower, who led the Allied invasion in Europe during the Second World War, once observed that planning, and using his word, steeps decision makers in a problem. In his words, quote, plans themselves might prove useless since in war nothing typically goes to plan but planning is essential. The United States, however, has no plan for how to adapt to climate. Instead, the United States government tends to wait for disaster to happen and then pour money into disaster recovery, spending most of its funds after calamity strikes. Just this week, the government watchdog, the Government Accountability Office noted that the failure to have a national plan for climate increased the vulnerability of our nation. Now, other nations across the globe have recognized the need to create robust national adaptation strategies. China unveiled its in 2013, Russia in 2019. Canada is deep in the process of creating one. The Netherlands, the country that's most recognized for its significant advancements in climate adaptation, now plans for the one in 10,000 year flood. A national plan could help communities make better choices about where and how people live. More than a third of our coastal states have added homes in areas prone to flooding since 2009. A similar phenomena has occurred in the American West with an explosion of homes built in areas vulnerable to wildfire. No 
percent of these homes in these areas are built to engineering standards that will guarantee they are liberal, livable after the fire or flood sweeps through. As more Americans pour into hazardous areas because they like to have a view of water or they like to live in the midst of wild lands and wild areas, they are living in homes that likely will not withstand future climate worsened disasters. This means that Americans are buying and living in homes destined to burn or succumb to flooding. Unfortunately, many people within government and business like me never received any formal education about climate change, either in their professional lives or in school. When I was at Stanford in the 1970s, climate change, if it was discussed at all, was viewed as a, just a problem for the distant future. And many of the leaders today similarly did not have the opportunity to study this issue. I have had the opportunity to immerse myself because I was given an assignment. But we are operating with leaders who do not understand the mechanics of climate change as fully as they need to. This means that they may underestimate the risks. By way of example, a recent study by NYU Stern Business School found that most board members of the Fortune 100 companies do not have any background on environmental issues. The survey analyzed the individual credentials of the 1188 Fortune 100 board directors based on their company bios in 2019. When it came to climate, just five, not 5%, just five directors had relevant experience across all those boards. Similarly, a survey of the core curriculum of the top 90 universities and colleges in the United States found that the average American college student in 2016 had just a 17% chance of learning about climate change before graduation through required courses. I'm delighted that Stanford has embarked on the important effort of creating a school focused on sustainability and these issues that hopefully will drive other universities to make sure that we are graduating students who can deal with the risks that are fast approaching. The resulting patchwork and understanding that currently exists has meant that many decision makers simply do not yet appreciate either the exponential nature of the changes wrought by temperature rise or how those changes will undermine every human created and natural system. So this is the most important thing I can leave you with. If all of us could internalize the fact that today's one in 100 year record breaking flood or wildfire or windstorm will be possibly a one in 10 year event in the not so distant future, and that the one in 1,000 year flood will be the one in 100 year flood soon, we would all make different choices. After all, it took Houston suffering three back-to-back -back one in 500 year storms for them to adjust their building code to reflect the possibility of higher flooding. The news about climate change today is not that it's happening, but that it's accelerating. To prepare for accelerating extremes, communities must consider the future risk of climate change as they make decisions so important to about how and where people should live. This is an all hands on deck problem. We need everyone finding ways to cut harmful greenhouse gas emissions. That's the best way to avoid the very worst of heating and it's a necessary component of any resilient strategy. But we also now must prepare for the impacts we will suffer going forward. And one thing to know, even if we cut our emissions to zero tomorrow, which appears highly unlikely, given what occurred under the pandemic, we will still have to deal with increased heating going forward simply because of that delayed impact that it takes time for the emissions to cause the heating. 
In short, the past is no longer a safe guide for the future when it comes to climate change. The question for all of us is, what will we do about it? I'm really excited to hear your questions, to learn from you. This is a chance for all of us to find a better path forward as we tackle with these really difficult issues of preparing for catastrophic risk. So thank you so much. Great, thank you, Alice. Um, that's, uh, that's wonderful. I think uh, um, really uh, inspiring words to both uh, think, yeah, I appreciate your, your clear communication about the, the challenges we face, but also your, your hope and, and your, your pragmatic uh, ideas about how we can contribute to a, creating a better future. Um, Thank you. And I think uh, we lost you for, for a couple of minutes at the intro, but I was uh, um, oh, pitching good. your uh, communications okay. ability and, and your ability to, <laughs> to, uh, to craft these it. disciplines. And I, and I think you you very much lived up to my, uh, oh, my hopes thank and you. Uh, pitch. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Technology is a challenge. <laughs> but it's, it's, it worked out great. It worked out great. Um, so we have a, a number of questions coming in. Again, I'll, I'll encourage the audience. We've got a, a large audience here, please. Um, type your questions into the Q&A panel and I'll, I'll continue uh, perusing those as, as Alice shares some more thoughts with us on these, the existing questions. Um, and we have, a, yeah, so we have a, a few minutes here for some discussion. Um, so let's see, uh, there's a couple themes kind of emerging from some of these. Um, so one, you know, I think that there's, you know, we've had 150 to 200 people on here. I think that looking at the names, the vast majority of them are, are scientists and engineers. Um, and I think you know many of us that are not uh, don't have deep experience in the policy world like you do, uh, you know, are asking ourselves the question about what what can we do on the, the educational front or promoting the, these, these um, better policies. You know, what what role do these technical experts have uh, to play in this in this world that you work in? Do you have advice for us and how we can contribute productively? Sure, um, I think that. Uh, first of all, continue your very important work. Uh, all of this uh, preparation is based on uh, science and uh, sound engineering. And so we need uh, many working on how do we project what the future will look like so that we can prepare for that future. And that's the gap we have right now. We have building codes. Uh, all of our standards rest on historical data. And that means it's not sound. So first, continue the science, no question about it. Second, um, I would see if there are ways that you can uh, make sure that you're also paying attention to applied science. We have something like 80,000 communities across the country, and they have no source, at least not from the federal government, as to under how to understand their risks. There's just no way for them to get that downscale data in an easy format. So I think that to the extent we can think through solutions that will, and think in terms of, I'll give you the best example I have. I spoke to a part-time mayor, Patsy Parker. She was the mayor of Perdido Beach in Alabama, right on the Gulf Coast. So they're facing heat, they're facing sea level rise, coastal erosion, bigger storms. She said, look, I get it. I understand that I'm facing future risks, but I don't have a planner on staff. I don't have any extra help. What am I supposed to do about it? Who's going to help me? So we need to all of us think about how we're going to have uh, applied science that's useful for those communities as they make their choices. And so that's the science, applied science. And then the third thing is, I think, and this is the, probably the most uncomfortable role for uh, scientists, they tell me it's uncomfortable for, the, for them, but they need to be communicators in this space. We need translators of all of this. Um, and in fact, you know, honestly, one of the reasons that I'm operating this space, I'm not a scientist, I was a judge, I'm familiar with uh, dealing, uh, assessing uh, scientific evidence. So that, is, that, that was part of my job, so I can assess the evidence from climate change. And by the way, under any legal standard, it's beyond a clearing uh, and convincing evidence, beyond a reasonable doubt that climate change is occurring and it's human caused, in my opinion. But we need translators. We need people who are taking the science and saying, look, this is what it means for you. This is how your decision making could change. And that I found for some scientists is a bit uncomfortable. Um, there are probably two reasons for this. It's the tenure system. You've got to publish or perish and you uh, tend to want to be able to write for your audience so that they peer reviewed and they recognize it. 
Um, and the second is that I think the scientific endeavor in some ways um, focuses on the uncertainty rather than the certainty that we do have. And it's the certain points that local communities need to understand so that they can improve outcomes uh, as they suffer these events, which they will. Um, and, and we actually have a question that I think segues uh, nicely from your, your last comments here, and, and it relates also nicely to the to the Shaw family's uh, work in, in probabilistic uh, catastrophe modeling. And, and so the question is that they, you know, the, the future has uncertainty and our, our models are, are uncertain and evolving. And, and do you have advice for us about how to communicate a probabilistic future in a persuasive and convincing way? Sometimes that uncertainty can be used against us or used uh, nefariously. Sometimes it can just confuse even more many people. How do you think about communicating, you know, real uncertainties without kind of creating, bringing along those problems that probabilistic discussions uh, throw into this uh, mix? Well, I um, say that as we're asking, um, say, a local planner or a mayor or someone else, we're, we're just going to have to speak in a, a language that's understandable to them. And, and sometimes, of course, the nuance can be lost. Um, but I think that one thing that, and I used it here, uh, uh, probably we need to get rid of is the one in 100 year flood. Um, that, that just doesn't, that, that confuses people. They think that means that they can only have a flood once a century. Uh, it, it's just very difficult. So we need to rethink our vocabulary. And beyond um, that, I think that uh, we need to work on our models and we need to work on them uh, quickly. We have the uh, global climate models, uh, but we're still working to downscale those. We need to downscale those and then we need to make sure they marry up with our catastrophe models that have been developed in the insurance industry and that RMS has done such an excellent job in. Um, but we also need to find a way to make these mod the modeling uh, publicly available. One of the risks that we run is that insurers, others will be able to afford, uh, major corporations will be able to afford these models as they work to prepare. But ordinary citizens and local communities won't. One extraordinary fact to me is that uh, you know, FEMA does flood risk mapping. Most of it, many of its maps do not yet include the future risk of climate change. Uh, and they admit that and they recognize that. It took, um, as far as I know, a very philanthropic person to underwrite a flood mapping system for the United States that captures future risk. And so if you go to First Street Foundation right now, you can type in your home address and you can find your future flood risk. That is a major step forward for the United States, um, but we need to figure out how we can do that with all these other risks so that a person can really understand going forward what's at stake. All right, thank you. Um, there were a few questions kind of related to um, land use and, and kind of where we are. So you, you mentioned this uh, tremendous growth in, in high risk areas that has occurred kind of all over the country. Um, and, and it was raised, you know, one, one person raised that, you know, affordability of housing is driving a lot of those choices. Um, you know, others mentioned kind of uh, yeah, land use planning and zoning. Um, could you talk a bit about the connections between affordable housing policy and climate resilience or, or zoning policy and climate resilience? Sure, that's what we hear. Um, well, uh, we need affordable housing. So um, in fact, that's what Los Angeles said after in 2018, after the devastating campfire, they approved um, a, a huge development just outside north of Los Angeles, uh, tens of thousands of homes in an area that uh, even using just historical data was identified as being extreme risk of wildfire. Um, and LA County Board of Supervisors said we're doing this because uh, we need affordable housing. My question is how affordable is that house if it burns the day after it closes? Uh, this is particularly acute in uh, Los Angeles. Um, right now, probably you get a federally insured mortgage, but if uh, the house burns up, um, uh, you're not going to have a house, you're not going to uh, have a place to live, and um, you will retain that risk and that credit risk going forward. Um, so it seems to me it's very short-sighted to say we're going to try to solve this pro problem by putting people at greater physical risk. Uh, and 
what we need to do are two things, improve our building codes. Uh, and that is one area that probably doesn't sound so sexy to um, some uh, students, but probably it's the most important thing that we could do going forward. As it turns out, uh, in most of the developed world, there isn't an existing future-faced building code. This is pioneering work. We need performance-based building codes, very familiar in the seismic world, where you look at the performance of the building after the event. So you're hoping people can move back in and live there. With our building codes here in the United States, we're just hoping that people can get out of the building and survive the fire or the flood, which means the building probably uh, could be uninhabitable. Uh, so I think it's um, difficult for us to uh, rely too much on this affordable issue because we're really saying it's a game of musical chairs. The developer doesn't hold the risk because the developer sold all the homes. It's the homeowner holds the risk if it burns. But ultimately, the way we're going right now, probably the federal government, we as federal taxpayers will hold a lot of the risk for these houses that go down because we'll give them a big disaster bailout. Yeah, great. Um, uh, and so I should say one solution, very unpopular, is greater density. Um, good, and I think that again segues to a, a few questions that had come in about, um, so um, you, you obviously have experience at the federal level uh, thinking about policy on this, and, and a couple of these have, have touched on kind of more local issues, but there were a few questions about kind of what should, should cities and, and local municipalities be doing to try to make progress, or if you were working at that level of government, what, what would be your priority areas to be working on? Well, I think it's very important to engage in planning. I, it seems so basic. I know it doesn't seem like rocket science, but um, planning carries many benefits. It, it forces people to look at the pro problem as uh, President Eisenhower said. Um, it forces them to look at solutions and it uh, forms relationships that hopefully can help drive greater resilience going forward. Uh, but in order to have informed discussions on this, I think we need real scenarios to plan against. Uh, and local communities not only need to plan for their own community, but they need to plan across borders, just like with pandemics. You, you, you can't keep that uh, flood from entering your community simply because you have a boundary that um, divides your town from the next. And so uh, all of us need to find ways to plan regionally more broadly to prepare because one community's choice to build a seawall, for example, to keep out flooding means if the other community hasn't done it, that water is just going to go right around the seawall and flood the two adjoining communities on either side. Uh, so we're at the beginning of this, but we're going to have many hard discussions. It's critical, in my opinion, to begin down this path. I will tell you that most local politicians, um, it's a it's very politically difficult for them to find the necessary funds to do the kind of mitigation work that's necessary. And that's where I think the federal government could provide incentives to local communities to engage in the planning and then help subsidize the necessary mitigation reduction measures. Great. And uh, we actually had a few questions about that, uh, that financing piece of the puzzle. Um, but, you know, are, are there are there policies that can you know get those funds available? Are there are there other financing mechanisms where we could kind of unleash some of the benefits of these pre preemptive actions um, and and kind of utilize the gains we know we're going to make to kind of spend up front and, and, and achieve those gains? Are there? Do you have advice for us on kind of putting that part of the puzzle together? Well, we did one uh, minor effort on this. Uh, not minor. It, it, it's an important effort, but um, it. it it tells you how this could go. Uh, after Hurricane Sandy, it was clear that the building codes were too low and a lot of homes were wiped out because they simply weren't elevated enough. Now, elevation isn't the long-term solution to sea level rise because you have to maintain the roads and the wastewater treatment um, and all the other infrastructure to support those houses. So eventually probably need to move back. But as an interim measure, the Sandy Rebuilding Task Force directed the federal government and actually the National Security Council to develop uh, the first ever national flood risk reduction standard. 
Um, and I was at the National Security Council, and that assignment fell to me, uh, the non-scientist, the non-engineer who um, was going to learn very, very quickly a lot more about standards. Uh, fortunately, a civil engineer uh, and lawyer, Eric Lepvin, walked into my office and said, hey, you need some help with that? Yes, I need a lot of help with this. So we developed a federal flood risk management standard uh, that requires either simple elevation of, uh, instead of one foot above freeboard, two feet above the uh, where it would, uh, assume, you'd assume flooding would occur. Uh, or we said in that order that you, in that standard that the community could use the best available climate scientist. Uh, President Obama signed that order and uh, agencies began to work through the regulation to accompany that order. 10 days before Hurricane Harvey dumped four feet of rain on Pancake Flat, Houston, President Trump revoked that order. But I'm proud to say that in his very first day of office, President Biden brought it back. So what's interesting about that is that our building codes and standards are really adopted on the local level. And that means that we have over half our states who do have not adopted disaster resi resilient codes. They're essentially betting that the federal government will come back in and help them out if the disaster happens. Uh, they don't want to incur the extra cost. Uh, so this standard said, if you want to take federal money, you will build to a higher standard. And I believe that we will need to do that across the board before disaster strikes. It's very difficult to impose these kinds of standards in the wake of disaster when people are uh, really crushed and just struggling to survive. So we need to push everything to pre-disaster as much as we can. Um, another line of questioning that's, that's come in, it kind of goes to the other direction in, in terms of spatial scale. So you, you opened by talking about these, these borderless disasters and, and really global challenges. Um, as we look beyond our own country's policies, I think the, the big majority of the audience is here in the United States. You know, how, how can we play a leadership role in, in the world? How can we help to mitigate these problems uh, beyond our own borders um, through our, our technical work or our policy work? Well, I think that we need to lend a helping hand to um, the developing countries. None of those countries have had any substantial role in creating the problem of climate change. Of course, the United States is historically the largest emitter now, uh, and, and overall emissions it is. Now China is in the lead on emissions uh, right now. Um, but we have um, many countries who do not have the resources of the United States to figure out what they need to do, how to do it, or fund it. Uh, and um, now they're saddled with the pandemic. Many of them have gone even more into debt to try to deal with that. So they have an albatross of debt around their necks, which will make borrowing more expensive. Uh, and they don't have the expertise or the means to really start making the choices that they need. They don't have good early warning systems, typically. They don't have many parts of Africa lack good forecasting uh, for events. And if they had good forecasting, they could help people get out of harm's way and perhaps even set up some kind of insurance system to get money to them quickly so that they don't have to sell the family goat or pull their girl out of school so to just survive these events. Uh, and it really, if you step back, it's uh, climate change poses a huge human security threat. So to the extent we can devote resources to helping communities be able to keep people employed, um, keep their kids in school, keep their economies humming, uh, we'll have better outcomes for all. Uh, it was Jim Mattis, uh, President Trump's first Secretary of Defense, who basically said, if we don't invest in helping these developing countries deal with these um, types of events, it just means the military has to buy more bullets. Now, that's a pretty stark way to, to phrase it, but there'll be deep unrest and deep global instability if countries governments cannot respond adequately to the kinds of threats that they're already under and will only worsen the time. So that means all of us can try to figure out how we can be better, uh, lend a better helping hand in getting better science, um, better ideas uh, to these countries that are struggling with 
finding solutions to their ecological problems uh, and the worsening impacts of climate change. Um, what a question on a, a topic that you, I don't think you touched on too, too much in your talk, but I know you've written about it in your book and in other places. Um, and it, what's the, what is the role of natural ecosystems in our, our risk planning? And how should we be thinking about the health of those ecosystems um, as we try to think about this bigger set of problems we're facing? They're, they're absolutely very, very important. Um, one of the things you see, uh, I've seen as I work on this uh, work, particularly in developed countries, um, let's take coastal flooding, the immediate reaction is, oh, we should just build a seawall. Uh, so they want to spend buildings, uh, billions on gray infrastructure, but we actually need to make sure that we are preserving our infrastructure, our ecosystems, um, mango forests, wetlands can provide tremendous buffers um, to uh, greater, um, bigger storms. We also, but we need to give those time. We know that if sea level rise comes too fast and we don't invest in those, we won't have time to, to restore them, plant them or preserve them uh, in the ways we need to do. Um, we also see um, that natural systems can um, increase biodiversity, um, can lead to um, a much healthier economy. So that needs to be front and center. That, I would say, is a shift from when I first started in adaptation. There's much greater recognition that nature-based solutions should be the first instinct not the last. Um, and that's not always true, but it is uh, really important. Now that the question is um, for, will always be how do we uh, fund these things, whether it's gray infrastructure or green infrastructure. And sometimes the green infrastructure, it takes a while for people to understand what's at stake, but um, the cost benefit returns are very high. And I think there'll be greater uptake in the future. I have a question here that's quoting from your book, so I think uh, it's great to see that some people are doing, doing their reading ahead of time. Um, uh, asking about how you know, governments are spending, you know, of the funds that they're, they're spending on climate change, they're spending it on reducing carbon footprint and carbon emissions um, and, and on recovery, but less so on this resilience and adaptation um, part of the problem. Do you have thoughts of what that balance should look like and how we can kind of tilt the balance to, to get more priority towards these resilience and adaptation areas of, of work? Uh, that is a really important question because what we see, and we didn't include these statistics in the book, is that about 95% of the funding for climate change goes to climate mitigation, reducing emissions. Um, and uh, that we also see almost all the philanthropic dollars go to reducing emissions, which leaves these communities highly vulnerable. Uh, there just aren't as many um, tools and resources available. Uh, I think that reflects um, two things. Uh, first is that uh, there's a divide in the um, climate world that has historically, it's improved, but we've had mitigation folks on one side, adaptation folks on the other, and sometimes they're not communicating. Um, and uh, in some instances, it was viewed that if you discussed adaptation, you were admitting failure on mitigation. Unfortunately, now the climate impacts are here, so it is necessary that we plan for them, and that it's becoming much more obvious. The other thing about adaptation that has made it hard is it's politically really difficult. Uh, you can just look in California to the discussions on managed retreat, for example, in Del Mar. Uh, people didn't want to talk about the fact that their home might be at risk of um, washing into the sea. It would hurt the property value. Uh, and we see that across the United States, a lot of uh, reluctance to engage in these discussions. They affect the tax base, they affect uh, people's most cherished uh, asset, their home. Uh, so uh, what can we do about it? I think we have to be frank about what's real um, and be uh, providing as many visualization tools, as many ways to communicate the risk uh, and then we need to be advocating for better outcomes in terms of legislation. One example would be we really don't have a disclosure laws on whether a property has even suffered flooding in the past, which if it suffered flooding in the past, 
it's a pretty good chance it might suffer flooding in the future, particularly with climate worsened flooding. Uh, but if you're buying a home, you could be going into that home not knowing that it's already, you know, had two feet of water in it in the past. So there are many policy levers that we could use um, to communicate risk through legislation, but also through innovative products uh, like uh, modeling that's visualized to help communities understand as they plan. Um, let's see. So, um, maybe I'll do two more questions. Uh, I've got sure. two kind of interesting ones. Um, so one, so we've already got a question about First Street Foundation. So again, it's lovely to see the kind of back and forth of uh, education that's happening here. Um, but it, so you mentioned that as a success story about um, kind of communicating and quantifying these flood risks. Um, do you have any sense from, um, from your exposure? Are there um, aspects of that that we could take as, as lessons to learn for studying other climate driven hazards like heat or wildfire? Like why was that successful that we could replicate? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a modeler, but I know that this must be incredibly difficult because otherwise people would do it because it's a very valuable product. But I can tell you the, in the space of wildfire, um, we have a crisis brewing, brewing because um, we're having difficulty, um, I'm told, in accurately modeling wildfire risk under the worsening conditions from climate change. The hotter, uh, the greater heat, uh, the drier conditions uh, makes the vegetation much more flammable than the fires create their own weather. These fire tornadoes, the embers fly further um, and can ignite houses. And we don't have as much understanding of what those dynamics are. And this has real impacts for what happens to California going forward. Um, the California Department of Insurance, in the wake of the last two big rounds of fires, has imposed a moratorium. And what does that mean? It, it, it's told insurance companies, you can't stop selling that policy to that homeowner simply because of an increased fire risk because of where that home is located. You need to continue to sell that policy. Now, it can't require new policies for new homes to be sold, but it's, it's holding, making those insurers stay uh, doing business in the state. That's not sustainable long-term. Uh, those uh, insurance companies, you can't just force them to do business forever. And what you, we may well see, then we have a backup plan in California. We have in many other states a fair plan, but what we're seeing is that fair plan, the number of people who have to go to that backup plan, which is for high risk properties is growing. Uh, and we've seen it in Florida that if the risks get too big, the insurers may just say, I don't wanna insure. And then that means, what does that mean for homeowners in these fire prone areas? Going back to our affordable housing, what happens when that home homeowner doesn't, can't get affordable fire insurance? Sitting in a home likely to burn and no insurance. So a lot of underlying assumptions that things will be available and they aren't. Um, and uh, it's wildfire would be a great topic for people to focus on. Um, and then uh, maybe a question to, to start wrapping up with is a, a number of people are asking, you know, there's, uh, there's individuals, uh, many individuals on the call that feel passionately about this are, are making their contributions. And then there's a number of people here on the call thinking about what Stanford as an organization can be doing additionally to make progress in this area. And you've talked about kind of the, the needs to educate leaders and, and the, the needs for technical insights and the needs for, for policy progress. You know, as a as an alum and a, affiliate of the university in a number of ways, you know, do you have do you have wishes for what you want to see from us as an organization and as a, a group of individuals in the coming years to help make progress on this problem? Yes, uh, and I am an alum. Uh, I met my husband at Stanford. Uh, both of our children have uh, gotten various degrees at Stanford. Uh, I love Stanford, um, and. Um, my husband is an academic, so I understand that it's difficult for universities to move on a dime. That's not uh, their, the nature of their structure. But we have a crisis, unprecedented in scope and threat. Uh, and I would say, I would hope not only for Stanford, Stanford's already creating a new school, that's very exciting, but I would hope 
for all major universities first. They would um, serve as a center of education. No Stanford student, and I can tell you, I meet a lot of students and I'm astounded, and these aren't, I'm not referencing Stanford, but how many recent graduates I'll meet who, for example, want a career in foreign affairs. And I'll say, have you had a class in climate change in your undergraduate? No, never took climate change. Okay, whole new set of experts being graduated with no requirement that they understand this catastrophic risk that will change the landscape of what we've all known forever. So that would be number one, that has to be core. No one should be paying or being graduated without some basic understanding of what climate change means. Uh, number two uh, would be, I think that we can, uh, it would be wonderful if we could rely on universities to be leaders, leaders in climate preparedness in their own communities. So that means that uh, they engage with well, outside the campus, outside the uh, fences, to really help communities come up with real plans about what they're going to do and then model the same behavior for themselves going forward. And through that process, they could educate their students, they could educate their faculty, and they could develop some of these innovative products that could perhaps be um, duplicated across the country to help people learn and understand with their risks and make better choices. So use the university as a laboratory for its own community to understand what's at stake uh, and help draw, uh, push ahead the planning for these risks. Um, so uh, those are two things. Um, the last thing I think is, well, the biggest vulnerability I see right now is for long lived infrastructure. We don't have ways yet that we really incorporate future risk. So we're putting up stuff now that could fail. And I think greater attention to how we can make standards uh, and practices that will ensure that these, we have performance-based standards for these risks. Like we have the progress that we've made in seismic, I would hope we could make here as well. So that once a community has a wildfire sweep, sweep through, more of the buildings survive and that people, if they're going to choose to live there, if it's, it is deemed safe, to, safe enough to live there, they can have the building survive similarly with flooding, whatever. But right now we're just building things that will fail. Great, well, for the audience, I, I promise we did not plan that question ahead of time, but I think <laughs> if we had, you couldn't have answered it any better. It's really very specific and, and very convincing ideas for, for what we could be doing here. And I think that, that'll be really impactful for our thinking. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to start wrapping up. Um, so first of all, I guess I'd like to thank the audience. So we have dozens and dozens of questions here. So your, your engagement has been great and, and sparked a lot of this, this excellent discussion over the half hour, uh, the last half hour. So, so thank you for all of your thoughts and, and my apologies if we didn't get to, to each individual one, but I, but I hope we hit a, a, a decent majority of the themes that were coming up. Um, and then more importantly, thank you, Alice. Um, your, your ability to communicate on these topics is really uh, remarkable and, and your experiences, you can, you, know, you can lend credibility to these ideas um, is great. Um, and, I, and I think both today and in my prior experience uh, engaging with you, it's, you, know, you, don't, you don't minimize these problems, um, but, but rather than you know, leaving the discussions feeling kind of hopeless and overwhelmed, you know, your, your repeated promotion of specific ideas and solutions, and it's not to say that the, the problem is, uh, is solvable, but, but that we shouldn't be hopeless, but you know, we really can make real impacts here. Um, and, and your ability to speak to technical people about how we play a role in that uh, is really remarkable. So I appreciate you sharing that, that energy and passion and, and expertise with us today. Thank you so much.